John Henry Irons heads home to Los Angeles. On the bus, he sits alone, recalling recent painful memories. Memories of a weapons demonstration that went wrong, very wrong. <laughs> this tank's on fire, man! <laughs> This is Little John. We've shot the sheriff. First weapons test terminated. Back up all telemetry. Hey, nice shooting, Johnny. Thanks, Sparky. Susan Sparks and John Henry made a great design team. Her genius for electronics fit perfectly with his talent for metallurgy. Together, they invented some incredible weapons. John Henry knew Sparks was one good soldier. <laughs> It's amazing weaponry, Lieutenant Burke. Was that maximum power? I personally made some adjustments, Senator, that increased the intensity considerably. Nathaniel Burke was a smart man, but he always had to push the envelope, take things one step too far. The weapons team had targeted an abandoned building for their next demonstration for the Senator. That isn't one of your heat pulse rifles, Irons. No, Senator. It's a sonic cannon. Pumps out an ultra-low frequency burst of sound energy. Can take out a whole line of troops without killing them. The way John Henry Irons liked it. But Burke... May I do the honors? Burke had to show off. Had to crank the cannon to full. John Henry saw him do it, but... Nathaniel! No! He was too late. The shockwave bounced back and hit them. Sparks! Sparky! The senator was killed. Sparks was buried under a mountain of concrete. This court martial hearing will come to order. Sparks had a spinal injury. Her legs had been crushed. She won't walk again. Tell us, soldier, why the weapon was set at a level of intensity that had never been approved for testing. Who recalibrated the weapon? Burke. Nathaniel Burke did it, sir. Thanks for selling me out, Irons. Payback's gonna be a pleasure. Burke was only discharged from the army. John Henry's colonel asked him to continue with his work creating the next generation of super weapons. But John Henry couldn't do it. Not after what happened to Sparks. John Henry visited Sparks in the hospital. You really did bail, huh? My tour is over, Sparky. After what happened to you, I ain't trying to go back. Where are you heading? Home. John Henry arrives back in his old Los Angeles neighborhood. He steps off the bus, a civilian once again. It's good to be home. Meanwhile, Nathaniel Burke arrives in Los Angeles. He enters Dantastic Incorporated, headquarters of local mobster Big Willie Daniel. Nice setup you got here, Big Willie. Word on the street is you're dealing hot weapons. I distribute arcade games, Mr. Burke. I give jobs to a lot of these at-risk kids. I've heard you'd sell your mother for a roll of quarters. You come here just to get your butt kicked? Is that any way to treat the man who's going to make you really big, Willie? Deal the next generation of super weapons, not to the crooks and punks on the street, but to the world. Give me some seed money to build my prototypes, do a little advertising, and we'll be partners in this together. What exactly are you selling? Burke shows Big Willie a stolen computer disk. Oh, now that's top secret. Yo, John Henry! Hey! <laughs> John Henry <laughs> runs into his 13-year-old brother, Martin. Together they head to Grandma Ruby. Since their parents died a few years ago, this has been the place they both call home. Grandma Ruby, what up? Hush your mouth, Martin, before you ruin everything. Somebody's here to see you. 
Hey, Grandma Ruth. Shh. Oh, Lord, John Henry, how I've missed you, son. But tiptoe on them size 22 shoes. Can y'all please tell me what's going on? Grandma Ruby pulls a soggy brown mess out of her oven. It's supposed to be a souffle. It's supposed to be all light and fluffy and full of air. Martin, how am I ever gonna master the art of French cooking when you keep crashing in here? Master the art of... I'm, 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 I'm marrying all my, my down-home recipes with hot cuisine. This here was gonna be a hominy souffle. Martin, you go finish your studies. I don't want no more of them notes from your teachers. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. The gang's still trying to get him? Worse than ever. It's hard trying to keep him straight. I'm glad you're back. Now, go unpack and check out the messages I left on your bed. Job offers, probably, from weapons makers. They were all really hot for you. You could write your own ticket. No more weapons. Bad for the soul. <laughs> oh, I love you, Johnny. I love you too, Grandma Ruby. Two months later at Dantastic, Burke preps a high-tech heat pulse rifle for demonstration. As promised, Big Willie, the first prototype. Burke, the front office said you had a kid you wanted to hire. Just a little personal score to settle. Burke aims the rifle at a target. The target is shredded. <laughs> the two men smile. Are the new recruits ready? You just say when. Tonight. That night, Norma, a police officer and old friend of John Henry's, drives him and Martin to a town meeting. Sounds whack. This meeting could help to set up the new anti-gang program. You might even learn something, Martin. Why learn when I can earn? One of my homies snagged me to work at a place called Dantastic. That's what Norma's talking about. Get away from those knuckleheads and into something legit. <sighs> a few blocks away, a black armored Humvee parks in front of a bank. The barrel of a sonic cannon takes aim. and a huge laser targets the bank's vault inside, melting the thick metal like it was butter. Five hooded men scramble out of the Humvee and into the open vault, grabbing up bags of money. Suddenly, on Norma's police radio, All units in the vicinity. Possible 211 in progress. 2218 6th Street. Three Adam Six. I'm three blocks away and on it. Yeah! Let's get ready to rumble! <laughs> As Norma pulls in, the thugs take aim. Heat pulses! John Henry instantly recognizes the rifle, one of the top secret weapons he helped create. Martin, don't move. Stay down until I get back. <laughs> I'm not missing this! Martin climbs out after John Henry. Burke's sonic cannon zeroes in on Norma. Ah! Ah! A shockwave slams into Norma's car, flipping it over and trapping her inside. Norma! Using every ounce of his strength, John Henry Irons lifts the police car, pulling Norma to safety. He spots one of Burke's thugs, accidentally left behind, running from the bank. Martin, take care of Norma until I get back. John Henry takes off after the thug, dodging bursts of blistering fire. He traps the thug and rips the heat pulse rifle from his hands. Where did you get this? Ugh! 
A heat pulse slams John Henry from behind. He hits the pavement. Stunned. The next day, John Henry is on the phone with his ex-colonel. Every weapon created by the U.S. government is accounted for. Colonel, I know what I saw. I caught a street gang kid holding a USR Model 3.5 Sonic John! Cannon. John, are you calling from a secure phone? What difference does it make, sir? We gotta do something about those weapons. John Henry joins Martin on Grandma Ruby's stoop. What did he say? He said the NSA is on it, that there's no way highly classified weapons could have ended up in the hands of a street gang. John Henry, you said that the guy you chased was sporting purple? Yeah. What's up, Martin? Who are you protecting? You! Purple is the Mark's color. Them kids is buck wild. They're the thickest gang out here. Where do they hang? John Henry enters the Mark's hangout. He heads straight for their leader, Slats. <laughs> Yo, dog, check out the Jolly Black Giant. That gun you had, where'd it come from, Slats? <laughs> hey, i like to know that too. That heater was fat. <laughs> like to get me one. John Henry jerks Slats off the floor and against the wall. Tell me what I want to know. My gang don't play that. <laughs> we know you, big boy. You're gonna know me a lot better. Minutes later, at Fantastic. Burke here. He came in here, man, like you said. All right, Slats, nothing changes. Just keep your gang out of sight. Got the webpage ready, Big Willie? Be online in a week. We'll be wired for the world. <laughs> We're covered. There's not a thing irons can do. John Henry visits old Uncle Joe in his junkyard, while Uncle Joe fashions one of his original scrap metal sculptures. John Henry searches for advice. I gotta find out who put those weapons onto the street, Uncle Joe. I feel responsible. Well, how come? Because I helped create them. Uh, what do you know about old Al Nobel? You mean like the Nobel Peace Prizes? Old Al come up with something he thought was gonna be great for mankind. Called it Trinitrotoluene, TNT. Then he spent the rest of his life regretting it. Feeling responsible. Exactly. For of all the people who died cause of it. So Al established prizes for folks who worked their behinds off to make a better world. What are you trying to tell me? Everybody ought to do their best. If working with metal's the best a man can do, then he need to do it well. Cause if a man's got skills for a higher calling, he better stretch on out and use them. What kind of skills you talking about? I'd have to be made of this to take on all that new firepower on the street. Well, maybe we need some kind of new firepower ourselves. I told myself when I left the army, I was done with those weapons. My specialty ain't electronics anyway. I work strictly with metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've been meaning to ask you. If I was gonna make me one of them alloys, you know, to make metal stronger, and exactly what do I do? You add something to it. You gotta add another element. Hmm. Oh, is that what you do? Suddenly, John Henry realizes what Uncle Joe is telling him. John Henry goes to the Veterans Hospital in St. Louis. There, he finds a lone figure in a wheelchair, staring out the window. Hello, Sparky. A good cop friend of mine got hurt with one of our weapons. I sure could use your help. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'd be a big help on the streets in this wheelchair. What are you going to do? Just sit here and stare out that window forever? You want to know the truth, Johnny? I just want to die. <laughs> You're talking crazy. Let's be out. John Henry scoops her up, wheelchair and all. Uh, stop it. Irons, I don't want to go. Sorry, Sparks. Sometimes you don't get a choice about things.
back at the junkyard, John Henry, Sparks, and Uncle Joe begin the construction of their new weapons. Hammering. Welding. Strengthening. Step by step. Day after day. Night after night, they toil. Don't you ever get tired, John? Yeah. But then I think of the innocent people who might get blasted by those weapons. What cop? Ugh. What kid? Using sheets of scrap metal, Uncle Joe constructs a homemade command center. <laughs> my oh my, that's ugly. <laughs> but it sure is strong. Inside the command center, Sparks wires together mainframe computers, modems, monitors, scanners, every piece of high-tech hardware she can get her hands on. This is actually gonna work. John Henry Irons, the master of metallurgy, carefully mixes a cauldron of molten metal, forging a new super-strength alloy, custom shaping the alloy into shiny plates to create for himself a full-body suit of shining metal. That night, Sparks wires John Henry's suit with a personal video camera and microphone. So watch what you say about me. The range is about 20 miles. Uncle Joe hands John Henry a surprise. A huge stainless steel sledgehammer. Man named John Henry has to have a hammer. Of course, I designed it to do more than pound things. I know you wanted to stay away from weapons work, son. But uh, sometimes you gotta fight fire with fire. John Henry slips on his helmet. The suit is now complete. That night, on the deserted streets of Los Angeles. Don't give me no trouble! All right, just take it easy. Let me see some cash, now! Here! Oh, please don't hurt me! <laughs> Get out of here! <laughs> Not a nice way to treat somebody's family pictures. Who, who's that? I'll cap you, man. Step out where I can see you. Out of the shadows steps the mugger's worst nightmare, a seven-foot-two colossus wrapped head-to-toe in shining stainless steel. Give them their money back and we won't have a problem. <laughs> I ain't got no problem. This is my hood. Put down the gun and there won't be any trouble. <laughs> Man, please. I'm about to smoke you. <laughs> In the command center, Sparks and Uncle Joe monitor the scene on video, but neither can watch. I don't want to look. Ugh, well, one of us has to. Unharmed, Steel unslings his hammer. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Hit me with your little hammer? Just the opposite. Electromagnet, engage. Steel's hammer slams against his own chest, magnetizing his entire suit. What the? Snatching the mugger's gun right out of his hand. Now do like a rash and break out. I, I, I'm breaking! I'm breaking! <laughs> what a magnetic personality. Ah, my screens show you've also attracted some official company. Of the blue kind. Got him. Okay, Sir Lancelot. Drop the pistol and get those hands up. Way up. Steel raises his hands. He punches a switch on his wrist. A titanium spike shoots up, embedding in a concrete wall overhead. Another switch. And Steel shoots three stories up. He didn't have to put them that high. On video, Sparks watches Steel ready himself to jump a huge gap between two buildings. Don't even think about it. Piece of cake, Sparky. My rangefinder shows. Yeah! He leaps, oh. but misses, just catching a ledge. Okay, one for uh, the computer. No time to breathe. Keep going, Johnny. Steel hauls himself onto the roof, runs to the opposite edge, and jumps. A microfilament wire trails from his wrist, controlling his fall. 30 feet to go, 20. The wire snaps. Steel falls. 
smashing into a pile of cardboard boxes. <gasps> Bruised, but not broken. Guess I'll find some stronger wire. That would be nice. The police surround the alleyway. A flash of silver bursts from the boxes. A steel-armored motorcycle. Steel's bike hurtles out of the alley towards an intersection with a red light. Sparky, give me some green. I'm on it. She quickly loads Steel's coordinates into the computer. Every light in his path turns green. And soon as he's through each light, they're back to red. A police helicopter arrives on the scene. Air 10, where are you? Air 10 overhead. We'll find him. The police helicopter closes in. Steel throttles straight at the fence surrounding the junkyard. Welcome home. The fence snaps open. Steel shoots inside, and the fence snaps shut. Where'd he go? Air 10, do you see him? Steel punches a button on his hand grip. <laughs> and a pile of scrap metal opens wide, revealing Steel's secret command center. Steel slips inside. I'm over the junkyard. There's nobody in there. I'm swinging north. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, Martin is given a tour of Dantastic by his new boss, Nathaniel Burke. Martin. I hear you're interested in our new microchip technology. Yeah, that interactive unit sounds. Fly? It is, Martin. We'll check it out later on. But if you'll excuse me. Word up, Mr. Large. Burke leaves Martin and heads to his office. Waiting for him is Slats. Slats, tonight I want you to stay precisely on schedule. We'll be videotaping the whole thing. Make ourselves a little infomercial. How much we getting broke off? More than you can imagine. Now what's the buzz on this steel guy? Some crazy fool running around in a tin suit? <laughs> Sound like the tin man on steroids. Listen to me carefully, slats. Never underestimate your enemy. That night, Steel and Uncle Joe patrol L.A. in Uncle Joe's van on the lookout for trouble. Back at the command center, Sparks monitors the city with his scanners. Heads up, guys. Something's cooking. The city's emergency services interlink shows a major telephone and power failure near Hope and Wilshire. We'll check it out. I'm zeroing in the Landsat. See if the satellite can spot any. Sparks? Sparky! I'm switching to a shielded sideband. Do you read? I read you. What happened? Jamming. Police radio frequencies are out, too. Something big is going down at 6th and Hope. I'm checking what's there. Oh, my God. What is it, Sparky? What's there? L.A.'s biggest ATM. The Federal Reserve Bank. At the Federal Reserve, Slats Gang uses their Humvee's laser to slice open the vault. The vault opens. They leap inside. It's filled to the ceiling with stacks of hundred dollar bills. <gasps> There's a zillion dollars in here. Uh, who's that? Steel, blocking the exit. No withdrawals. Awesome. Slats gang fires. The shots knock Steel back, bouncing off his armor. Jump in the van. Go. The gang scrambles into the Humvee. Slats aims the sonic cannon. That fool is a dead man. Steel is hit. Johnny! He slams into a building. You're outgunned, Johnny. Bail! A police helicopter circles overhead. Slats, this is Burke. Do the chopper. Take that sucker down. Slats aims a heat pulse rifle up. I'm hit. I'm hit. I'm going. Steel rolls to one side, just escaping the crashing copter. The police close in, and the Humvee peels out. Get out of there, Johnny. They don't know you're one of the good guys. 
steal Gunz's motorcycle, the cops right behind. He hits a button on his hand grip. Hundreds of razor-sharp tacks spray out of his bike's tailpipe, blowing out the tires of his pursuer. You've still got blue on your tail, Johnny. Make the next right. You'll see the rabbit hole. Ahead, Steel spots Uncle Joe's battered van, a ramp hanging from the rear. Steel drives straight in, and the police drive right past the van. Meanwhile, at Dantastic... Mr. Burke, we got a pretty good trace on whoever that steel guy was transmitting to. We should be able to find his hideout. Find it. And here. He hands over a videotape. A recording of the entire Federal Reserve robbery. Get copies to every TV station in town. After they stick this on the 6 o'clock news, I'll be selling our toys of terror to every skinhead, mercenary, and drug dealer on the planet. <laughs> the next day, at the Steel Command Center, Sparks and Uncle Joe nurse John Henry's wounds. You may be steel on the outside, but you're still flesh and blood underneath. Hmm. Too much blood, looks like. I'm... Oh... Okay, it's just a scratch. I, I think your ribs are broken. I've got to find Nathaniel Burke. I have a feeling he's down with this somehow. The TV station said the tapes of the robbery were sent anonymously. <laughs> Big time infomercial. High tech weapons not available in any store. So, how does a buyer make contact? Huh, in this day and age? Hmm. <gasps> the internet. Sparky quickly logs on, then begins surfing the web. Minutes later... Found it. The big auction is going down in 11 hours. They give a location? Not till the last minute. That night, while Uncle Joe and Steel patrol L.A. in Uncle Joe's van, Sparks monitors the internet. Sparky, have you connected with the army yet? Not yet. I... Hang on. I've got a location for the auction. Off Eagle Rock Boulevard. I'm scoping the image from Landsat. Hmm, looks like some kind of an abandoned factory. I'm calling the cavalry. Strike Force David, this is... What the... Sparks turns. One of Burke's thugs is behind her. A magnum leveled at her head. Sparky, confirm that you've contacted the Strike Force. Sparky! She out of range? Shouldn't be. Better keep going. Outside of town, Steel and Uncle Joe find the abandoned factory. While Uncle Joe waits in the van, Steel sneaks onto the factory roof. He looks down through a skylight. Inside the factory, Nathaniel Burke is surrounded by an international assortment of criminal masterminds. Gentlemen, I've already made quite a few of my dandy little toys. You've all seen these weapons at work on TV. <laughs> Steel crashes down through the skylight. Party's over. Steel reaches for his hammer. Uh-uh-uh, you might want to think about that. The door opens, revealing sparks. A thug holding a gun to her head. That was a quick fight, huh? Now hand me that hammer like a good little boy. Steel hesitates, then hands it over. Now, gentlemen, let's talk weapons. How much was it cost us? Millions. But I'm sure you can all afford it. I mean, do you really want to be the only one without my kind of firepower? Before you answer that, let me give you a little demo. Behind the door is Slats and his gang with their Humvee. I always use expendable rats for preliminary testing. You've seen how powerful these weapons are, but gentlemen, I've developed weapons five times more powerful than the ones you've seen. <laughs> Only five times? What you got, a water pistol? My hammer's got more juice than that. That's somewhat hard to believe. See for yourself. Just don't twist the red switch, or she'll be too hot for you to handle. Burke aims the hammer at steel, his finger over the red switch. The red switch, huh? 
Honestly, I was planning on using you for my demonstration anyway. Electromagnet, engage. The hammer flies out of Burke's hands and slams against Steele's chest. You had to push the envelope. Kill him! Maybe not. Sparky hits a switch on a wheelchair, and a laser shoots out of the hand grip. Burke's men die for cover. Steele corners Burke, aiming his hammer. Nathaniel, give it up. First, let's see what's behind door number two. Martin! <laughs> Came on a little field trip with old Mr. Large, didn't you, Martin? Understand, Johnny? Success has never been enough for me. I always need to see my enemies fail. Now step back. Me and my new best friend are driving out of here. Yes, again. Uncle Joe leans in a window and fires a heat pulse rifle at Burke. <laughs> the explosion knocks Burke back. Martin grabs his chance and leaps for safety behind steel. Burke scrambles onto a waiting Humvee. He aims his newest, deadliest weapon at steel. You haven't seen this toy, have you? Mr. Steel, you're going to the scrap heap. Peace, John Henry. Or should I say, pieces. Burke fires. Steel turns his back on the blast, shielding Martin. A wall of boiling energy ricochets off steel. <laughs> Slamming Burke and knocking him backward off the Humvee. The factory catches fire. How do we get out? Everybody in the Humvee! Steel hustles Uncle Joe, Sparky, and Martin into Burke's Humvee. Johnny? You're Johnny, ain't you? Get in the vehicle! This is dope! My own brother is still! Yo, I could be like Robin! I could get a cape! Martin, you wanna know what you can do to help? What? Anything! Don't say nothing to Grandma! National criminal chieftains were arrested on charges of conspiracy last night. It's also been confirmed that the mysterious armored man, known only as Steel, was primarily responsible for exposing and foiling the plan. <laughs> John Henry, Sparks, Uncle Joe, and Martin all help Grandma Ruby celebrate the opening of her new French and soul food restaurant, Black and Cordon Bleu. Today's special is lobster, mm. served out of the shell with a sweet potato cream sauce garnished with crisp okra. Well, Grandma well, well. Ruby, you are amazing. I tell you what sounds amazing. All this stuff on the news about that there steel man. Mm, mm, mm. Well, tell me, what do you think about him, Ruby? Well, I think, uh, I think anybody'd be mighty honored to have him in their family. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, y'all start eating because I got a surprise. Oh. Mm. My piece de resistance. <laughs> she unveils a beautiful right. souffle. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, ain't that something? What a person can do when they put their mind to it. Yes, sir, it is. When you've got the right kind of help. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Now be careful, that's right.